Okay, guys. Uh, so uh, we'd like for people to reserve their questions to the end, given that likely you will have a lot of questions. Um, so I'd like to make a disclaimer. This is, represents our views and not our company's. Uh, so these slides are, are available um, on Google Docs. And um, the ones that were uh, published earlier were premature. So please go ahead and download the new ones. <laughs> so we're going to review how to kill proprietary drivers. And uh, this is a general outline of uh, what we think uh, we can do to try to kill these drivers. Uh, our focus is to prioritize writing clean kernel APIs in code. Uh, we want to permissively license the Linux kernel drivers, localize the usage of GPL, uh, use BSD or BSD license repositories. We're going to cover intellectual property as engineers, uh, replace internal code bases in favor of working with two upstreams, uh, Linux, Linux upstream and then BSD distribution or BSD repository, address driver unification, um, and like to make it clear that we're not attorneys. This is just engineering uh, proactive strategies. So how do we get here? Atheros had worked with Sam Leffler eons ago. Uh, and Sam had worked on publishing Mad Wi-Fi in the community. Sam Leffler eventually pushes uh, his 8211 stack into BSD. Uh, Linux rejects Net8211, though. Sam eventually moved on. Uh, in the community, we started embracing our own 8211 stack. Um, then we, we start working on regulatory solutions. Uh, SFLC ended up helping the community on upstreaming F5K, which is a completely open uh, driver for Theros hardware. Uh, this was licensed, the HAL component was actually licensed under the ISC license to help OpenBSD, and the reason that that was done is that we actually, in the community, embraced uh, OpenBSD's reverse engineered HAL called R5K. So we wanted to ensure that they can reap benefits from any of the changes that we were making. Mad Wi-Fi, NetBSD, and FreeBSD pick up Sam Leffler's HAL. Um, at that point, there was no binary HALs in free, free and open source software operating systems. Uh, I later joined Theros, and we, after I joined Theros, uh, our team worked on upstreaming the FNK driver. That was the first Linux driver that Theros actually pushed into the Linux kernel by corporate support. This was licensed completely under the ISC. Broadcom eventually follows suit, and they uh, upstreamed their own driver using the same ISC license strategy. Adrian then joined us. It took about a year to hire Adrian, working with visa issues, so it was a pain, but He's now with us. Uh, Adrian actually works on FreeBSD. Um, I started then reviewing uh, our internal code bases. And I was tasked with trying to come up with ideas of how to improve the quality. So I started working on proposals and passing these around to engineers. Now, in the open source world, we, we tend to balance, have the balance between making it work and making it right slightly differently. Um, most of the, well, all the op open source operating systems worth talking about, and that includes Linux and the BSDs, um, they, we tend to accept people posting patches that solve specific problems, but we tend not to integrate them unless people have discussed them and thought them out a little better figured out um, what the general solution is, figure out what the, the better engineered solution is, to the point where you guys have pretty anal um, maintainers who just won't accept. Is my head in the way? Yeah, oh, God. I was thinking, why, is my, why do my eyes hurt? <sighs> um, who just won't accept bad code. But when you're selling uh, products, uh, what you... And this is not just people making chips. This is people who actually develop anything that you have a 
a business pressure, time pressure to get to market, they tend to sacrifice design and code quality for time to market. They, they, they tend to not worry so much about the long-term stuff, at least up front, um, than, they, than, they, uh, than the rest of the community does. So it's not unheard of to find some other vendor who comes to you two or three years later on down the track saying, hey, I've implemented this new platform support. Would you mind integrating it? And you say, well, it's been three years, right? You could have come to us early and we could have started integrating this platform support or this new driver framework or whatnot. And uh, you guys have, uh, have, had, have had this experience with Android. Um, and it's taken a little bit longer than normal to get that in there. So, you know, it, it depends entirely upon uh, uh, more than just making it look good. And a lot of open source people either don't or won't look at the real world problems that come with getting products out the door. Uh, and on one hand, you do need purists in the world, but on the other hand, someone's got to sell, sell stuff, right? And if the Android guys couldn't sell their phones until you guys were happy with an upstream support, none of you would have Android phones today. Uh, so somebody has to sell something at some point. Let me just reread this slide. So in the good old days, before we actually had open drivers, we had lots of closed drivers. And plenty of people disliked this very much. So what tended to happen was people either had uh, code drops from very infrequently from other vendors, or you would end up reverse engineering a binary driver, or you would actually get a data sheet, and you would write them yourselves in, in the open world. And in the closed world too. I've heard stories from people having to reverse engineer Windows drivers to get a platform, something going on a closed platform as well. Um, the trouble is, is these days, we have more than one platform to support, more than one operating system on more than one platform. And so companies that actually sell hardware have this problem. Have, uh, mo most of these companies have a problem where we actually need to have different drivers with overlapping requirements and over overlapping features run on completely different hardware and completely different operating systems. And so the question is, is do you actually write standalone drivers for each operating system and go through the engineering process of doing so, or do you try and find a middle ground where you can share some of the engineering requirements to do so? Linux only really started becoming a priority in the last few years. Up until, I'd say, the Android revolution, the fact that there was open source drivers was mostly because vendors were either had specific large customers that were twisting them but they weren't really as widespread as we'd all like to pretend they, that they were. So by and large, a lot of this stuff was driven by, a lot of our, our open source stuff was driven by what hardware was actually being sold and what drove sales up until five or six years ago was predominantly Windows. As much as we like to hate that, on, at least on the desktop, that was, that's the unfortunate truth. Now this has changed quite a bit as Linux has slowly gotten more and more momentum and then Android went and changed the dynamic of it a little bit more, but again, what drives hardware sales doesn't necessarily translate to what we want in an open source community from our driver development. Um, commercial drivers versus uh, open source drivers also have different requirements. When we, and I'll talk about this in a minute, when we bring up in more detail in a minute, when we bring up a bit of hardware, there's a lot more involved than just making it push packets or, or serve, or serve uh, bits off a hard drive. There's a whole engineering process behind it which most open source developers either don't know or can't appreciate. There's all kinds of certification and regression testing that we have to do, and we have to do this on multiple hardware platforms. So I've seen our lab, and I've seen photos of the Microsoft Windows uh, laptop lab. And if you can imagine warehouses of laptops to do ACPI testing, order, uh, where, where laptops just spend their entire lives going up and down out of suspend states and doing traffic testing and downloading things and crashing and coming back, that's the kind of thing that people who actually develop commercial hardware end up doing. But in the open source world, before I started working at, at Theros, it's not the sort of thing that you really think about. You just get a laptop and then you swear a lot because ACPI doesn't work. Um, so there's a lot more going on in the background than we'd like to believe. We are very critical software assholes when it comes to what we'll let into our kernel and our operating systems. But that doesn't necessarily translate to the time frames that real engineering has, real product engineering has. The, the easy thing for us to do is actually for us to just quit our jobs and not work for any silicon company because 
it's it's really easy to just say that we don't want to deal with this issue and I think a lot of engineers do this in the community you have a lot of uh, programmers who basically just don't want to deal with these issues and uh, just want to work on what they want and not, not address these core issues um, we also have some coworkers who just basically run off to the Himalayas um, and I'm not, I'm not kidding about that too um, Whenever, so whenever people complain about our Theros USB wireless driver support issues, it's because the one guy who looks after it goes to the Himalayas from time to time. <laughs> so, I mean, if we just run off, uh, things won't change, and we want to actually create a change. So addressing these issues are actually not trivial, and uh, we have politics to deal with. Uh, a lot of things in, 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 a, in an archaic way are being done. We have a, a lot of educational issues both at the company and also in the community. Um, so we started thinking about working with the community. This may work, um, and we want to engage with the community, and that's why we're here. So we, we have reviewed these strategies first internally, and now we're out here in the community, and we want, we want to discuss what we've been reviewing and see what you guys think. So something I'd really like to get the community involved in at least to see what's involved it what is what it takes to actually go from the concept of having a chip all the way through to getting a driver going and so when you when you when I you come and look at an Ethernet driver and you go okay well that doesn't look too hard it may really not tell you how much was involved in doing the silicon design and doing the verification and getting the compliance testing done and doing the regression testing with other with existing hardware I mean uh, if any of you have worked on Ethernet devices and had to deal with things like order negotiation issues back in the past, you know, that, well, we, yeah, it's still a pain in the ass, right? I mean, th these are the things that we, in the open source community, we fix when we need to, but in, in terms of pr providing uh, a commercial solution to an, end, uh, to an end customer, we need to get this as tested as possible so there's the minimal chances of this stuff uh, uh, happening when our customers buy our new products and then because driver development isn't stagnant we then need to have the platform ready there to do all that regression testing whenever we do changes and so if you imagine what it would be like having to test your device driver with all the other device drivers in that particular environment on all the different platforms that you guys use that's the kind of testing that that some chip some chip companies try strive to do I'm not going to assume they all do so Things that I, I wanted to sort of cover here is stuff like compliance testing and certification. In, in wireless, there's a hell of a lot of certification and compliance testing done, not just, not just for regulatory compliance, but Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi Alliance compliance for implementing certain protocols and features and, and, and regression testing for all of the weird and wonderful ways that stations associate and do power saving and exchange traffic and handle failures. So our driver, our, or whatever software we have internally, not only has to push packets, but we have to use it for things like compliance, regulatory testing, equipment calibration, regression testing, uh, certification processes. And if you guys either re-implement a driver or take our newly open source driver and start cutting out the bits that you don't see being used, those bits, we may not have told you what we're using them for, but a lot of the times those bits were used for some kind of engineering purpose or some kind of debugging purpose. And the more that you cut out of your internal, the, the, the upstream driver in whichever OS you're in, the less likely we are going to be able to use that driver in any of our new engineering processes. So it's perfectly good looking at it from the point of view of this is what the end user uses, but we need to think about a little bit more than that. Um, there are some silly vendor-specific test code which Lewis and I have started looking at implementing in the driver. So one example is uh, regulatory testing requires us to transmit tones on specific frequencies for Etsy, I think FCC certification, but specifically Etsy. Now, the last thing we want is someone to have an Ubuntu install that lets them select a, t a frequency to transmit a constant tone on. But if anyone wants to build a Linux access point and have it licensed in Etsy, they have to pass certification. If they have to pass certification, they have to be able to put this equipment in these test modes. Now our internal driver has all of this framework for doing this testing, but the external driver doesn't. So we need to come up with ways, for example, hiding it behind an expert option, so that what ships with a default distribution in the, in the compiled driver doesn't necessarily have all of this stuff turned on. But for companies that need certification, we really want to have this in, in the upstream kernel. The last thing we want is to have an internal copy of the driver that 
we just give to customers for certification, it kind of starts defeating the purpose. Um, customer extensions that they pay for, this is a standard thing, I'm not going to go into that too much. Um, the, the other thing to keep in mind is, and this isn't necessarily from our, from, from our employers, but if you do a little digging into binary drivers, a common argument that they come up with, uh, and it's happened recently with ATI and the DisplayPort stuff, is they cross-license patents and intellectual property from other companies. And a lot of, that, a lot of times, those cross-licenses, they save them engineering time, but making that decision means they can't open source stuff. So if you go to phronics.com and search for ATI, you'll find that they recently had this problem. They were looking to open source their ATI drivers. They hit a point where some of the driver code can't be open sourced because of these, the choices they made much earlier on in the, in the game. So if we were going to do, if Lewis and I were going to do an open source driver, these are the sort of things we need to keep in mind because the decisions we make early on in the, in the, in the, the uh, development of a product can preclude us from even be, being able to open source stuff later on. The other thing to keep in mind is, when we release a chip, customers expect us to give them a driver. It doesn't mean that we've necessarily had all the engineering time the, the, to do correct engineering to get it working and make it look pretty. And then making it look pretty happens later, or at least we try to make it happen later. Um, we need to make it work when we ship. And those time t t deadlines are pretty tight. Um, if we ship a, a chip and say the driver will be ready in three months, you can guess how many people are going to buy that chip, let alone get, be able to get it certified because we haven't released any of the certification stuff for it yet. So we need to break all of that down one by one and address them to try and uh, involve what we push into open source, well, what com companies push into open source so, so that they can use, they feel comfortable pushing into open source, that they're able, they're allowed to push it into open source. And we don't necessarily hackle them, uh, heckle them for pushing what looks not necessarily very pretty because of their engineering timelines. Next button. Next one, mine or yours? The other thing to keep in mind is, is, uh, is the multi-platform uh, prospect. Every hardware vendor that targets you know, PC hardware now has to support pretty much Windows and Linux. That's a given. And if you're a USB vendor, you tend to have to support Windows and maybe Linux, but at least Windows and Mac OS. Um, so, so even today, you've got more than one platform that you have to support. And the last thing you want to do is have all of that testing I spoke about and all that engineering stuff that I spoke about before in two separate driver code bases because that means you've got two separate groups of engineers, two separate uh, hardware labs, two separate regression testing suites, lab equipment, uh, 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 expertise, different documentation. Just having chip documentation doesn't necessarily help you when people go and have to find workarounds that they do in software. Then you've started adding this thing where every time someone does a commit in one branch, is it applicable to the other operating systems? So how much of this can you actually share? Our driver, as an example, internally supports all those operating systems, including VxWorks, because customers do ship access points running VxWorks. So a, a, an Ethernet driver may not be terribly complicated un, unless you're Intel and you were one driver that does a whole lot of stuff. Um, but, you know, Ethernet compared to wireless is pretty easy. Uh, compare something like the InfiniBand stack to, to wireless, right? I mean, well, to Ethernet. The InfiniBand stack is a lot more complicated than what Ethernet looks like. Uh, and wireless is the same problem. There's a lot more going on than just pushing packets. So do we really want to maintain not only a driver, but all of the code that does Wi-Fi, or all of that code that does InfiniBand? Does the open source community really expect us to try and maintain more than one code base for each operating system that we target. And yeah, going back to Lewis's talk yesterday, if we want to support legacy Linux operating systems for, for commercial reasons, do they expect us to maintain multiple copies of some legacy wireless InfiniBand whatever stack as, uh, along with our drivers to run on older kernels? But whenever, we've, whenever people have tried this, it, tends to not look very nice. So the Etheros HAL shared a whole lot of code um, for all the radio stuff, and that worked quite well um, because a lot of the code to speak to the radio didn't really ha have much OS dependencies. There was no locking or threading issues. There weren't any, uh, there wasn't any, anything to do with uh, the, the, the bus API or your concurrency API or interrupt method. This was just effectively, Operate uh, like, like 
object methods touching the radio, okay? But that's all you could effectively share. I mean, we could, effect, we could share the, some of the stack and we could share, share the, um, the wireless stack and some of the wireless driver, but the data path had to be different, interrupt handling needed to be different. So the real question is, is how much can you get away with sharing? Um, and what, do you, what, what compromises do you have to make? And this is one of the things the open source community disagrees with, with, with uh, commercial vendors trying to do this is, you guys don't want compromises. You guys, and, and BSD guys as well, we want a driver that works really well on the operating system that it's on. And again, that's great. But as a commercial vendor, the question then is, well, do we really want to dedicate, have completely dedicated resources for different versions of stuff on different operating systems? Or do we want to try and bring some of the, this engineering together and accept a 10 or 20% possible penalty for um, performance if what it means is, is we need one third the engineers and we've, we have the time to market. And those are the pressures that we care about just as much as we care about code correctness and performance. But every company probably does this differently. So Theros is not the only hardware company that has a multi-platform driver platform. Every hardware vendor I've spoken to here says, yeah, we do it. And some of the vend storage vendors that aren't here, they say, yeah, we do it as well. So every hardware company has, to, has had to and still maintains multi-platform, multi-OS and multi-platform drivers. But we all do it differently, and we're all reinventing much the same wheel in order to do so. And this seems a little silly. I'm going to explain uh, what we call crap driver in the Linux community. It's a technical term, really. Um, there's a, a flag that taints your kernel. If you actually load a driver, the driver would be a driver in under driver staging. Uh, right here, uh, you can actually see the diff stat uh, between 3.3 and 3.4 and just staging alone. Uh, the second line is actually a non-staging. That's quite a lot of changes. What's going on there? Why are there so many changes in those drivers? Um, so crap drivers uh, address runtime func functionality, uh, and they do it really well. And uh, actually, some companies uh, go so far as to actually support those drivers. Um, and it amazes me. Um, doesn't really mean that it's good from an engineering point of view. Um, some attitudes in some companies are to not call software crap. It's banned. Uh, I, I believe that that tends to lead to bad software. And I think that we need to accept criticism and actually evolve. Uh, and that's what we do in the community. In BSD and in Linux, times we, we have to accept that some of our software is, is crap. Um, y we need to accept that we can improve software. That's just a philosophy that I think uh, engineering needs to, needs to embrace completely. Um, Non-crap drivers <laughs> should actually be uh, prioritizing code readability and long-term maintenance. That's something that I think companies tend to not really think about. Uh, or at least they think about it, but they, that's one, once, once they're already uh, in too deep. Um, also, crap drivers don't really consider an ecosystem. And we have a large ecosystem with Linux and BSDs. Um, branching hell. Well, you know, it turns out that not only for us or, uh, or a few companies here, I mean, most vendors tend to deal with this issue. Ten vendors take to to take their drivers and basically fork them, and then you have to maintain them. Why? Because they're customers. Um, sometimes uh, even good software in the kernel that's not even in staging can become crap. Uh, and I'll admit it even for my own software that I write. Uh, this happened with the regulatory solutions that we had in the Linux kernel. Uh, this actually evolved first from reviewing how uh, Mad Wi-Fi impl implemented regulatory uh, through the open HAL that we had, and then uh, it evolved into reviewing how the uh, internal driver actually did regulatory work and then reviewing how all the other vendors did regulatory work, trying to unify a regulatory solution. We had something in the kernel now, and it works. But, you know, it's, it's a bit complex, and I accept that now it's crap, and it has to evolve. Uh, so... Some of the suggestions that uh, I made while, while reviewing the internal code base was um, pretty much things that we already do in the community. Things like uh, um, always, uh, you know, uh, modularize the code, uh, assign component owners. Uh, we, we need to make our changes clear. We need to ensure that we propagate fixes uh, and annotate those fixes. Um, 
the commit logs need to be very, very, very clear. Um, I, I also thought about the idea of uh, uh, throwing developers to through a Linux boot camp. Essentially, give them some exposure to the extent to which we are anal about software quality, just to get an idea. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they have to do it all the time. Um, and there's obviously some quite a bit of benefits with collaborative development. So now I'm going to address a, a strategy um, that I know some people disagree with, but it's it's a possibility here. And this started uh, coming to light once we started working with the community on on getting at 5K into the kernel. Um, historically, uh, BSD is actually a, an older license than GPL. Um, and the Linux kernel never really embraced GPL v3. It's stuck on GPL v2. I don't see it really moving. I don't think it's going to happen. But you know, um, we have to deal with the license, right? Uh, turns out that GPL v2 uh, software projects can actually incorporate GPL compatible components, and that's exactly what we did with at 5 k and we did that to help the Open BSD community. Um, we learned from that while working on AthNK at Atheros, and we essentially decided to push a completely permissive license drive into the kernel. Now, in the Linux kernel, you've had actually a series of different drivers with the module license, dual BSD, GPL. Now, this has actually created quite a bit of confusion. You don't really need to state that a license is dual BSD and GPL because both licenses are compatible. You only need to address a dual license strategy when licenses are actually incompatible. Turns out that all these dual licenses are actually compatible. We should be able to replace dual BSD and GPL with GPL compatible. Um, the changes license under tag was one of the tags that we devised when reviewing uh, with us SFLC how to address when we receive contributions from the community, how are we going to guarantee that those contributions to this GPL v2 project are going to be kept under the ISC license? Um, but uh, the community reacted and uh, told us that it was completely necessary and that the signed off by tag was good enough. Turns out that uh, that, that actually is the case if you actually proactively uh, engage with your developers and every single contributor to Linux kernel understands what the signed off by tag is. There's a clause under the signed off by tag that indicates that when you're contributing to a specific file under a specific license that you're actually making that contribution to that file under that license. So what we do is we just basically keep engaging developers. Every single contributor that we get to, the, to our drivers, we ensure that they understand what the signed off by tag is. We also make it clear our intent is to help OpenBSD, FreeBSD, NetBSD, and even allow us to integrate and cherry pick changes back into our own drivers. That actually hasn't happened yet, but it's something we want. Why not? Um, AthNK actually was the fully, first fully permissive license drive in the Linux kernel. Um, Solaris actually ended up um, expressing interest into using AthNK, so we told them, hey, go ahead, take it. It's permissively licensed. It's an example of a vendor taking something that's perm permissively licensed from the Linux kernel, extracting it, and using it on another operating system under whatever license. Um, Broadcom actually followed suit, as I indicated earlier. Um, so I'd like to make a call to permissively licensed future drivers in the Linux kernel. Consider that 70% of the software that goes into the Linux kernel actually are drivers. And uh, drivers are not really hard, too. Um, counter to this argument that some community members may make, is that they're concerned about losing the GPL in the kernel. Well, GPL already carries its weight in the Linux kernel. It's a GPL v2 project. We're only addressing here permissively licensing drivers. Core kernel functionality should essentially just remain under GPL v2. I mean, yeah, well, GPL v2. Um, so we can also ensure that the community receives contributions by actually proactively engaging in companies. If companies can address their needs, companies should be able to contribute. So um, some people have asked me uh, if GPL drivers are possible. And it's a difficult question. There are po some strategies that one can address. And I'll review one, one of them here. Andy Grover works for Red Hat. Um, he actually uh, wrote a GPL v2 private virtualization driver um, 
for Windows. Yes. Uh, he ended up using Ming GW because you can actually you cannot use uh, Windows uh, Driver Development Kit because of the licensing. Um, so he succeeded in this, and this driver exists today. And there is a website you can go read his blog post about this. And this happened quite a quite a while ago. He explained to me though that it was very painful, and that in order to actually write GPLv2 drivers, you actually need to be become a Ming GW developer because there's a lot of components that are missing. It's a pain in the ass. So the other half of this particular discussion is what about all the code that vendors have internally for their own engineering purposes? Um, that they don't necessarily want to have either touch the GPL or they don't want to put in the upstream kernel or that the rest of the community doesn't want. And so one of my ideas is to actively engage them in doing two things. The first thing is to get them to push an upstream solution into Linux because that enforces them actually trying to do mostly the right thing in terms of engineering for an open source project. But then all the other code that they actually have and maintain, all, the, all that engineering time and all of the bug fixes that go into their internal driver code bases and their firmware, why not try to get some of that opened but not necessarily have the, that particular code in the Linux kernel and or GPL'd? Now, a lot of people go, well, if we do that, we'll just have the mad Wi-Fi problem where uh, uh, all the... All the the GPL code drop problem from our, our, our wonderful Asian vendors like TP-Link and D-Link that will just give us a tarball of code and no real history of what's going on there or how it works. And what I'm trying to get across here is, is this is not a replacement for putting things upstream. It's to try and capture the rest of the engineering process that go in internally as much as we can get exposure to that so we can start to see what's actually going on so the community can see this for a couple of reasons. The, the first thing is is I'm a BSD guy and I'd like to be able to get BSD source code. But my BSD hat off. Um, it also means that the community can, can participate in the, in the effort to actually get bug fixes from their internal drivers that are now not internal and start it, testing them and integrating them into the Linux kernel so that instead of it having to be done by the vendor, the community can take a much more of a proactive, um, proactive stance. Now, the feedback I get when I say that to people is, why don't they just give us data sheets? And, and something I've learned working at Atheros is data sheets are only as good as the errata and the bug tracking that you get with them. And I'd like to reiterate this for people listening online or whatever. All of the interesting crap that I've had to deal with with the Atheros 11N stuff in FreeBSD in the last 12 months, 10% came out of the data sheets and 90% came out of their bug tracking system. Not only that, I'd like to also um, uh, give another example. We were just at, well, I'm not sure if you made it, but there was a UEFA uh, UFE talk on, on the uh, you know, BIOS replacement uh, by Matthew, and uh, one of the issues that he expressed was the bugs. Uh, they permissively license that software, but it has a lot of bugs. There's no public documentation on that. Mm -hmm. There's no bug tracker. So that's not how you engage with the community. Part of the Part of the solution is to engage with software, but also provide documentation, bug tracking, and everything. So something that's been going on with Ath9K and some of the vendors, and I, I'll, uh, um, and if you're on the wireless mailing, the Linux wireless mailing list, you'll see that there have been Ath9K and Mac 802.11 updates from Google has been uh, bug fixing going on there. And some of the bugs will be in our internal database, and some of the bugs will actually pop up in one of the public Bugzilla repositories. So something that I've been trying to push forward in terms of Ath 9K development is, if we're going to be supporting an upstream driver in Linux, then we should also be as much as possible engaging our engineers and the community in actually doing bug investigate hardware bug investigations as much as we can publish them through that. Now, some of the bug contents we can't publish externally for whatever reason, and I'm just going to say reasons, but a lot of the discussion is still perfectly relevant and useful to have in some open fashion. When I went through and was uh, cherry picking Ath 9K fixes to bring up the 11N stuff in BSD, the, the Felix Fiatkow and I would spend quite a, few, quite a bit of time scratching our heads going, why is this change in Ath 9K? Right? It just appeared with the code drop. We have no idea what this why the code does it this way, why the hardware's tickled in this particular order. And we had to go into the internal driver and the internal driver history to figure out exactly why this was done. Now, 
if we were able to find a way to engage companies to do more public driver development for their non-Linux driver stuff, and that doesn't preclude them from having proprietary extensions, but it means that as much as they can open up, they can, then we at least can get them comfortable with the idea of sharing this stuff, and we can benefit as an open source community from having all that interesting engineering expertise that isn't captured in a data sheet or an errata. And that's the sort of stuff I want to see. I've seen how useful it is internally for me to have access to this stuff, and I think the community as a whole would benefit just as much as companies would benefit having their stuff open. We want to encourage companies to participate. We don't want them to just simply dump horrible code. We want the community to be able to help them uh, adopt engineering practices as much as we want as a community to get a better understanding of what it's like developing and testing hardware. And hopefully what we'll find is there'll be a nice middle ground where we can start using some of their uh, regression testing, if they publish regression testing stuff, certificate companies that need to, de to deploy commercial, co commercial solutions can cherry pick the certification code out of the open drive, their, their, uh, their non-Linux upstream and push it upstream. If someone has a specific need for something, they can do it. The company doesn't necessarily then have to try and meet everyone's requirements in the open source world. They can address this by meeting their own requirements but having their driver code and engaging the community in an open fashion. And I'm not saying that they need to have everything open because some companies will want to keep extensions to their driver stack and their uh, application stack private, but that's what good API design and that's what good software structuring gives you. Gives you the ability to do an open driver with proprietary extensions that you can implement open extensions to replace. Um, we were looking at using the BSD license, but you know, whatever license, whatever permissive license, BSD or ISC type license that companies are comfortable with, so they retain control over their code, I think is worthwhile. Um, I'm not going to address the patent question, that's for a lawyer. Um, we don't really want to have patents in the kernel for a lot of this stuff. Sometimes it's unavoidable, sometimes it's not. This is a discussion to have um, with, a lawyer, with a team of lawyers to figure out where the right middle ground is. My aim is to get this open more than to worry about the sort of uh, uh, software slash hardware patents. And if, there, if that's a problem, then we need to address it. Uh, yes. yes. So I'm not an attorney either, but uh, even before I joined uh, the company that I work for, uh, I've actually been engaged with attorneys. They represented me way before I even joined. Uh, so somehow I've had some exposure to uh, legal issues, and uh, that's quite a, quite a lot what I do is just working with attorneys. Uh, so as an engineer, um, I've made some uh, recommendations as to what likely we could consider. I'd like to throw some of these ideas out there. Um, there's a general issue in the community that we see, and uh, one of that is patent trolling. Um, Everyone's just suing everyone for patents, and it, it's an issue, especially with software. In a free software community, patents in software is just a can, big can of worms. Um, it's, a, it's a big issue for us. Uh, so as an engineer who works on the kernel, I believe that we can simplify this. Um, the, let's face the fact, the Linux kernel is licensed under the GPLv2. You have to deal with that. Um, I am proposing a way to deal with the GPL v2 project though uh, and also help with this strategy and that is to localize the GPL. If you want more details, please read my blog post. I, I elaborate a bit more on how I think that can be accomplished. Um, so new drivers should be permissively licensed. That 70% of drivers that go into Linux kernel it's not rocket science. It's really simple stuff. Permissive license that stuff. It's, it's, it's not magic. It's crap. Really. Um, we should prioritize clean kernel APIs. Um, and we should also re do early review uh, of architecture when we're doing development. Uh, we should also, during that early development in architecture design, we should try to move intellectual property to user space. Let's simplify this problem. Um, there, if you are going to deal with intellectual property in the Linux kernel, there's one example where someone dealt with it, and that's the uh, explicit patent, patent grant, well, sort of explicit patent grant under the RCU mechanism that IBM provides. 
Uh, there's actually documentation of it uh, under documentation RC or RTFP. Read the effing uh, papers, actually. That's what that means. Um, there's also one other strategy that some companies may consider, uh, given that the Linux kernel is a GPLv2 project. Uh, there's a license called a clear BSD license. That license removes uh, any patent grants or implicit patent grants. It removes all sort of notions of a patent grant. Uh, that actually didn't, didn't really work. There was a patch submitted uh, to the Linux kernel, and uh, basically that never got accepted. So uh, there's a case where that basically just didn't go through. So uh, I, I don't see any other option but to try to address this and try to simplify the problem by moving patents to user space. Um, and I'm not saying that I'm, 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 I'm advocating for patents in user space. I'm advocating the fact that this problem can be dealt with a lot easier in user space. And I, I think that, as Adrian mentioned, we're, we're not attorneys, and I think that attorneys need to deal with this. Attorneys should get together, work on this, and figure out a solution that works in user space. So what are the business justifications in working on this? Well, you can streamline uh, and lead operating system designs and ecosystems, which is very important. If you're working on sharing software, you have to build an ecosystem. Um, you can also benefit from the collaborative development model for non-Linux operating systems. Um, can the community be re relied on? Can you bank on that? Uh, IBM did. Um, and what IBM understood is that you need to understand the community. Uh, development happens because people are motivated. You have to study why people get motivated. And innovation is something you can also leverage from. Uh, we also have a dispersed community. We can actually scout talent. Adrian is a perfect example. Uh, <laughs> this guy was just you know, in Australia, you know, being active in, in, our, in public mailing list. We picked up that he was really talented. He was just asking the right questions, really difficult questions, and now he's working with us. Um, it's a perfect example of how you can scout good talent. Um, can you count on the community? Well, it turns out that the community is the largest contributor to Linux kernel. Google Summer of Code is another example. Grant is not the best quality of software, but it's proven to be quite successful. Um, so as I indicated earlier, you cannot really solve this problem by just throwing out code. You need to provide specifications. You need to s stimulate motivation, stimulate innovation. Uh, and let me show you how um, contributions go in the Linux kernel. The top graph right here <laughs> is uh, None and um, unknown. That's pretty much uh, hobbyists and random people who are just not, not accounted for. They're the top contributor to the Linux kernel. The, the fastest growing project, software project in the world is led really by hobbyists. Here are contributions to Athline K upstream in the kernel. Uh, at first, obviously, we were the first contributors to it, but eventually we started enabling a lot of developers. Uh, and we gave documentation to some key developers, uh, some software to some developers as well. Uh, and eventually, it spiked up. And now we have a good balance. That's, I think, an ideal situation for communities. If you have no contributions, you're not really taking advantage, and you're not really doing a good job in enabling the community. So what are we doing? Well, um, we make Linux already a priority. Linux upstream first. Um, we also do automatic backports um, to help customers get an idea of when certain things would, well, our marketing actually get an idea of when certain features or certain chips as will be supported. Uh, we have a website where you can go and guess that. Um, the backport stuff allows us to ensure that we prioritize upstream and provide our deliveries to customers based on direct upstream development. Um, we use config experts for some vendor specific stuff that not necessarily every Linux distribution or user wants to enable. Um, Adrian actually joined us, uh, and he's a free BSD developer. And you know, this conversation is exactly a good example of what this can lead to. Um, so we start off simple. Uh, it's a big problem to try to address you know, killing a proprietary driver or any proprietary driver. So let's simplify it, just like with the intellectual property issues. And let's start off very simple by addressing Ethernet, which is the simplest driver that we can likely work on. And we're, gonna, we're looking at this with the ALX driver. Um, 
this is has been submitted, but it was rejected by by David Miller. But we address our concerns and our interests uh, to use a permissive license for new, our new chipsets, and he seems to be reasonably okay with that as a strategy. Um, so we're going to be working with this, uh, and then we're going to try to address uh, a BSD strategy as well. Um, we're hiring too. So this whole process started with this funny idea that we can have one driver or shared code on multiple OSs. And it's sort of become less about that and more about at least starting to engage uh, hardware vendors and, and software vendors as well, but primarily hardware vendors here, to get them to open up some of their internal stuff I as well as contribute to the Linux kernel. And, and, and for, the one, for, the, for the vendors who make the mistake of using uh, GPL with uh, GPL Linux distributions on their embedded hardware, uh, and then are forced to open it up, well, they're already doing this, right? So it's not like vendors aren't, being full, aren't releasing driver code. It's more how can we improve this process. Um, so can we at least start to enable the community to unify the driver uh, um, support and the, and the performance and the feature sets between what's already upstream in Linux and what's being developed for other platforms in, in the internal drivers? Um, the three options we've got is we can, we can give a go away. We can just say it's a company problem, it's your problem, and we'll just continue doing our own stuff, and we'll, 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 we'll lead as much as we can, as much as we're allowed to, as much as we can get away with, and uh, it's everyone else, you know, dog eat dog. We'd rather not do that. Um, we would rather look at helping with unification and or opening up stuff. We would rather um, try to... Uh, encourage co companies to open their stuff up. Whether or not they want to do the unification themselves isn't really my concern at this point. I mean, there are plenty of uh, slightly manic open source developers who would quite happily take a close, an open source crappy driver and re-implement it from scratch in a Mountain Dew field weekend. And this has happened many, many times. It wouldn't be the first time and it certainly wouldn't be the last. So even if they just did a code drop, this sort of stuff would happen. We don't have to do anything except make the code appear and make sure that they don't get sued. Um, but is it good enough to just do that? I mean, we kind of really want you to open up your stuff, uh, open up your crap, uh, open up your internal driver, try to engage the community as part of your, your software development engineering process and have both sides benefit from this process. Um, and what we want to try and explain to companies is, if you do this, the open source community is going to come along and do what happened with App9K and what happened with FreeBSD's wireless, where the community members are the ones that go off and make your upstream driver start working better. And if you can play a role in that, um, then the, my aim, for example, would be to start using a, our internal, start using something like App9K for some internal engineering. But we can't because it's just a wireless driver. It doesn't have everything else. The community, they can start seeing what's involved in this process being in, and, and, and accepting some of the, the, uh, the uh, restructuring and some of the API changes that need to happen, then, then companies may be able to use what's in the Linux upstream as part of their, uh, as long as it's, as long as it's uh, 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 permissively licensed, they may be able to start using some of this stuff as part of their uh, future engineering processes. But there's a lot more that companies need to be comfortable with before they can even begin that route. So we've got to get them comfortable first. So, uh, is unification possible? Um, corporations keep doing this, and they keep trying, and I think that they're doing a horrible job. Um, can the community help? Uh, that's why we're here. Uh, part of addressing a driver strategy with BSD and Linux, uh, there's a big question. Can we actually address unification? If it is possible, my answer to this is that you need to make it a community problem. We need to engage with the community and take the problem and address it very differently. Um, can we live with Linux in a BSD repository? Can we sort of somehow manage to figure out a unification strategy based on those licenses? Uh, I mean, those uh, two upstreams, for example. Uh, well, it turns out that uh, I've been looking into other ways to deal with uh, porting uh, software. Uh, and spe this was specifically for uh, uh, backporting. And as part of that process, I learned a bit about uh, a project uh, by uh, 
some folks in France, uh, Espatch, uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce, Cassinel, uh, and uh, there's this thing called uh, SMPL. Um, and SMPL was, uh, well, Espatch and SMPL was designed originally for collateral evolutions of Linux kernel. What that is, is formalizing the idea that you can actually have uh, changes in APIs in the, in the kernel and that those require changes in drivers. So that's what this utility was written for originally. There's this other thing called spdiff, which allows you to skip writing SMPL specifically, and you give it two patches that demonstrates the change, the evolutionary change or collateral evolution, and it spits out SMPL for you. What this means is that you can, from two patches, you already can essentially, well, the idea here is that if you essentially port one driver, from one OS to the other, you can also do, use the same language, the same SMPL to port that other driver, not only for backporting or addressing collateral evolutions. Um, and we're still, there's a part of the last slide, we're still evaluating how, n how feasible the, the, the SMPL grammar is uh, and what, is, what can we express and what can't we express. Uh, and, how, what, what, do, what, what do the drivers have to do? What do the driver developers have to do? How does the code have to be structured, et cetera, et cetera? I have a linguistics background. It should be, it's a fun project. Um, so what now? Um, and this is where we start throwing stuff out to the, to the audience. Is, uh, what we'd like to see is, more, uh, is try to find ways to engage hardware and software vendors in opening up some of their uh, engineering practices so they don't just simply throw code over a, over a uh, uh, a big wall. Um, we'd also like to have them, have them participate as, in the development process as much as the community does and have the community understand what the engineering processes are so hopefully we can find this nice middle ground. Um, I would like to see verification, validation uh, and regression testing as well, for, particularly for wireless and certification testing for wireless. I'd like to see more of that appear in the upstream. I, I'd hate the idea of, of a company having to do you know, go through months and months of formal validation for their closed source driver for all the other platforms and have to go through exactly the same stuff for a Linux kernel and not have the driver and all the framework open to let vendors and users do exactly the same kind of testing because it's a nightmare. I've watched certification stuff. It's kind of, kind of scary. Um, and this is not something that we are the only people doing. So if you're working at a hardware vendor and would like to admit so, even if we do know, uh, I, I read patches as well. Uh, I see the, the kinds of stuff that gets pushed into, into the staging kernel. Um, we'd love to hear what your experiences are. Uh, I'd hate for us to try and solve this internally inside, inside QCA, and I say QCA here, not anything else, um, only to find that other hardware vendors uh, either try solving it a completely different incompatible way or they have to go through the, the whole process from scratch again, and it just it seems really inefficient. And I would rather try to find a way to get some vendors to make this whole process together to get make this process a little easier to eat. Um, and yes, SMP, SMPL review. I'll actually get to use my arts degree. It'll be kind of fun. So uh, that's pretty much it. Um, so the objectives uh, here in, in the long run is to uh, for us as engineers to consider some of these uh, ideas. Uh, these are not easy to actually um, um, use or, or embrace as a company, but we're just engineers and we're just throwing these ideas out there and trying to look for solutions and we hope that we can accomplish them by trying to uh, break down the problem and addressing it in a very simple way first. Um, so is there any questions? Do you want to give them, you want to run up and give him the mic? Be gentle, we're just engineers. So you got two problems, first off. Wireless is a special case. Yeah. You got the FCC involved. And you, I, I work for Cisco, I can't publish how to tune and tweak my wireless because of power constraints. And uh, you know the fun thing to do is if I had to access to the uh, spring networks, 900 megahertz, I'd definitely put a tone out and jam every one of the F the uh, PG&E smart meters, okay? Absolutely. All right. So, and I have done this with... But hold it, hold it, hold it. You can right now. 
You can buy Ubiquity NIC and just spew crap. Yeah. Buy your 900 megahertz Ubiquity NIC, and even with the closed driver, you can just, you can just interfere as much. Right. Right? Okay. It's not like I'm magically enabling you to do anything terribly more than you cannot, can't currently do. True. But not everybody wants to... You know. I'm not saying that you should. I'm just saying, right? And it's not like 900 megahertz is out of the realm of some dude with a soldering iron and some veriboard. I mean, it's 2012. You're dealing People with mostly software engineers here, I know. not hardware. I know. Okay. Now, the other issue Thank God. is that you know companies with ASICs make diagnostic interfaces for testing their hardware, and sometimes they don't want that out because it's used for support cases when products go bad in the field. Okay. Putting that out then starts putting holes in all kinds of products beyond security. They become back doors. They become entry access points. No, so for our stuff in, as an example, right, in our hardware, our Theros hardware, right, that, there's a lot of undocumented registers. But what we do for diagnostic stuff for us is, for, for Rath9K is, is we'll, uh, for the developers that have signed the NDA and have access to more of the documentation is, is there's stuff in Ath9K that takes statistics and do register dumps as a diagnostic API, which isn't terribly good, but at least it's there. And then people like uh, Felix and I are able to look at the register dumps and squint a bit and go, that looks wrong. The fact that I can read registers now without glasses, without, sorry, a data sheet makes me feel a, lot, a bit like I'm in the matrix, but regardless. Um, but the other half of this is, yeah, there is going to be stuff that you won't want to open up. Like, we wouldn't want necessarily to commit all of, all of our stuff, but we may want to put APIs there to let us ship to a customer some extensions for doing debugging. But you just made the point to publish all Ah, I said, as I know, I, the caveat was publish everything that you could, don't want to keep proprietary. You've got to publish as much stuff as you can, but some stuff is going to, is going to remain proprietary. The question is, is do you say, well, because some code is proprietary, we can't open all of it up? For example, if you sprinkled all the way through your code base a whole bunch of if def platform BB FPGA diagnostic version 3, and you have this hash defined everywhere through your code base, opening that up is going to suck, right? It just is. Or you sit down and you go, I'm going to, I'm going to engineer my, my driver so that I can petition what's easy to open up and what's not necessarily easy to open up and then say to the community, this stuff is enough to do normal wireless stuff and these APIs we use for diagnostics and engineering. And if that's what the comfortable line in the middle of the sand is for, if that's what keeps a company happy, then that's a good starting point. But do we then say companies aren't willing to do this so let's not even try to attack the problem? Then we're, get, we're back reverse engineering USB devices by sticking a USB protocol sniffer in the middle and I actually do believe that you can open everything up. Um, I don't think that you can open everything up right now. Uh, and the way to do that is by ar reviewing the architecture design really early. If you can't do it right now, maybe two years from now you can. If you actually review the architecture, punt things for whatever it is that you want to innovate in user space, talk to your attorneys. I ask you to engage with your attorneys and have them do a bit of work on trying to figure out a free software friendly way of addressing whatever it is that you want through user space with a proper option driver. The problem is that typically people don't do this. They're, and the reason why is people don't want to address these problems. Like I said earlier, it's easier to just quit. But there are ways to do this. You just need to ask the hard questions. Well, you also have to remember that there's the business prevention and just, job justification department in big companies where people who actually have the task of doing the diagnostics and the certification want to protect their job. And yeah, I, I mentioned politics is an issue. Has anyone here actually deployed a Theros wireless stuff using open source stuff? Put your hand up. Have you ever heard of a problem called stuck beacons? Yeah? Okay. Stuck beacons is when the transmitter can't transmit a beacon frame and it signals to the, to back to the OSA. I couldn't put it on the DMA queue, but it wasn't sent. And if you have enough of them, you have to reset the chip. Now, the motivation behind it, though, sorry, the reason behind it is wired and varying. And until I started looking at it a couple of years ago is what got me into this entire getting hired process. Um, we didn't, in the open driver, we didn't really have a handle on it because 
partly because it wasn't documentation, but partly because we didn't know what to look at, we didn't have the tools to do stuff. So there is plenty of stuff that we can, plenty of tools that we can write for just like doing a Theros chip wireless debugging based purely upon what's open, right? And we have driver, we have tools internally to do this sort of stuff, but they're not pushed out. But when the open source community says blah, 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 stuck beacon, I know what they should be looking at, but what we're missing are tools that use already public register definitions to diagnose what could be a, a, a host bus interface problem, what could be a, a radio problem, what could be a stuck Mac problem. My, one of my stuck beacon issues was because the PCI Express bus in one of my machines was bad. The point is, is I, want to, I as, a, as a developer, want to make my open source end users have the best diagnostic tools that they can so that my job as an open source developer is easier. I, I'm sick to death of people emailing the list saying, stuck beacon stuff can't work. So you could either be comfortable opening up the stuff like Atheros did and then allow people to write tools and what the community hasn't done for whatever reason is written these tools and something that I'm trying to address as a side project or you come up with the diagnostic API and you ship them a binary that does all of the diagnostic stuff as you know mega raid CLI does or whatever the other some of the other uh, uh, storage cards do where the driver gives you an iOctal interface that's just a pipeline to send commands to the firmware and you have no idea what those commands are but a lot of the diagnostic stuff for these storage controllers happens that way. Now, I'm not saying this is a perfectly good open source clean method but I'd rather have the diagnostic tool than not have anything. And once the diagnostic tool was there, people in the open source community started reverse engineering the commands and making it work in other, in, for other things, other diagnostic modes. But what a company is happy with. If you've got a question, please come up to the microphone. My voice is loud enough, I talk, but okay. So uh, idea of opening up the driver is, I think it's pretty well-intentioned, but the how far down do you want to go? Do you want to open up all the register specs? I have not seen a simple chip vendor that will actually open up the register spec. Well, the counter question is, is well, again, it would be nice if you had completely open hardware, but that's a separate discussion, right? And there may be reasons why you don't open up these things. I know of some. You know some. I'm sure people here who do hardware stuff know some. The question is, is not how much do you want to open up. It's, it's can we get companies to engage us not just on completely opening things up, but engaging in the process of doing actual driver development, open driver development, rather than just throwing crap over the, over the fence. And I mean, we've got to get them used to something first before you have any, any chance on, in a heck of trying to get a company comfortable opening more stuff up. You've got to get them comfortable participating in some kind of uh, uh, back and forth collaboration. Otherwise, they're just going to keep throwing code over the fence and you're still going to keep scratching your head because there's magic numbers everywhere. The other thing that, that I've seen is that it, companies tend to never address at documentation. Documentation is one of the things that typically is never given to the community, you know, uh, in engaging. Um, we actually have an NDA program right now where we essentially engage with uh, lead developers in the community that we see that are active, and we give them documentation uh, to work on uh, open projects. Additionally, uh, working actively in the community has also pushed us to categorize documentation. You, what you will see is that most companies, if not all, simply have two philosophies that they think that they should use for documentation. It's either proprietary or proprietary. That's it. Uh, but there's no other categories. You should be able to split you know, documentation to something's public. All right, what's public? How often do we review this? How often do you guys review this? You know? uh, yeah, what's the router process? Uh, is there a way for us to get bugs out to the community so that they can actually review details? Is there a way for us to actually engage with maybe some lead developers who actually do care and know what they're talking about and give them access to some errata under NDA maybe or something? What are we doing? I mean, Adrian is a perfect example. We, we enabled Adrian very, 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 very well even before he was hired. He had a lot of documentation that let him do a lot of great work. That's things that I don't think companies think about. That's part of the enablement. These graphs that you see here where we have a match between contributions of the company and the community is because we actually enable the community. 
Yes. So just operationally, if you had um, a, a website or a registry where you could um, uh, sort of throw out um, uh, permissively licensed drivers, that would be a, a big help in, I think, getting companies involved. And could also be seeded by um, non-corporate copyright holders of uh, GPL licensed drivers who could then say, hey, you know, I want to contribute to this effort. If it's already there, I, right. I'd like to hear I mean, about part, it. What I'd like to have is that, but I'd also like to be able to have things like a, a bug repository, sure. right? And I'd like to involve them. I would like to make sure that whatever they pushed over the fence would actually build and run in some useful fashion. Right. I mean, the number of times people have done a GPL code drop that doesn't actually do anything, or, or by the way, you need the compiler, or, or by the way, you need blah, right? I mean, I'm glad I'm not crazy Eastern Europeans reverse engineering this crap because uh, drive me slightly mad, mad. So yes, that would be nice. And, and right, I mean, being perfectly honest, right now a company could quite happily sign up to Google Code or GitHub or whatever and say, project license BSD, and then done. But there's more to it than just sure. a place to put the code. And whatever the, the whatever companies are, uh, uses their reasons for either not pushing code out or not enabling other d d developers. I mean, in the past, some, some storage developers and network and, and NIC developers enable some developers with NDA and driver access, much like they did with, uh, with me for wireless stuff. Why companies don't do this or have cut back on this or like the process, as I said, is much, is much more interesting to try and fix the process and get them engaging the community rather than just throwing code over the fence because the last thing I want to see is just here is another drop, here's another code drop and then you do a diff and you go there's 14,000 lines of diff and I don't know what, what what does what. Yeah, you just have to start someplace yeah. and you know, maybe it not be the best but it's simple. Right, uh, yes, and it would be, I mean, there's, there, are, um, there are certainly sites out there that aggregate what? TP-Link and D-Link style vendors do when they have to do, f or when they choose to do code drops. So this is definitely something that's going on right now. So, so this is maybe more of a, a comment than a question, but uh, you mentioned InfiniBand earlier, and that's the... <laughs> oh, don't get me started about InfiniBand support. Well, so that, that's the world that I come from. Okay. I was involved in that kind of from before it was merged upstream. So we... You know what they did in FreeBSD? We implemented yeah, so a Linux that's... compatibility layer because you guys would only engage with the Linux community. Well, and so we have the minimum amount needed to port the InfiniBand entire stack in its entirety from Chelsea over to FreeBSD to run their driver. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> was, that was kind of my, my what I was going to say is, um, you know, even before that merge, which I guess was 2.6.11 or something like that, but the, the whole InfiniBand stack has always been dual license GPL BSD for right. historical political reasons. And uh, it didn't really help on the BSD side. But what, mean, why didn't BSD. it help? Yeah, well, that's kind of my The question. reason it didn't help is because all the, it's exactly like someone doing a Microsoft driver dump. Like someone gives you the source code to a Microsoft driver and you go, great, now I can't really run this. Oh, look, there's NDIS wrapper. So you get an InfiniBand stack, which people are using in BSD right now, but it, because it's Linux only and your focus is just Linux, and we don't know what you do for Windows or other, whatever other platforms you have, right? Um, anything that you have that lets you do, oh, it's like, say you have a shared code base that lets you run the same driver on both, and then you strip out stuff as you push into, B, into Linux. We don't get to take advantage of any of that, so we ended up having to implement the, the Linux shims primarily because we wanted to take the driver as, as much untouched as possible in order to make future code mergers easier, mm -hmm. right? And what we would have, I would have rather have seen is some kind of external repository where you say this is what our, this is our shared driver that we actually have running on multiple OSs and then we push from that into Linux as we need to and then the BSD guys can take from that and push it into two and anything, that, any abstractions and stru data structures and API choices that you have in your shared driver that makes OS portability easier and I have admittedly haven't looked into it since the initial code drop, so I don't really remember the details. That could have made it easier to port to BSD, FreeBSD, NetBSD, Dragonfly BSD, whatever, right? Um, so that I think was the main problem. And and it's it's interesting because you you know you guys you pushed a, a, a Linux um, um, uh, optimized driver into Linux, and what we've had to do is take the unoptimal approach in order to maintain code. Uh, make make it easier for us to merge stuff from your driver because you guys don't engage us directly, right? 
Um, yeah, I mean, so as a Linux developer, yeah, I don't work on FreeBSD, and I'm, you know, I. But do you guys have people internally that work on Windows? Uh, well, I'm not internal. I'm a community developer. Right, right. But you so do, I'm guessing they have people internally that work. We have an entire team of people who do Windows. We have an right. entire team of people that do Mac OS, an entire team of people that do Linux. And yes. then we have an entire team of people that do at 9 k Linux. I mean, how can we make that process easier? Yeah, I think, you know, you mentioned time to market pressures and all that. So if I, as a Linux community guy, there's really no incentive for me not to write a native Linux driver, right? I mean, it's a lot of extra work for me to try to come up with some abstraction layer and... and oh, as a community guy, yes. So, But the company has done all this work already, well, is that, my point. I mean, that's why the InfiniBand stack is a native InfiniBand stack. I mean, a native Linux stack, because I, you know, I was not writing it to support multiple OS. Right. I was writing a Linux stack. And the companies who build the hardware don't care about BSD. I, no, no, no. But, they, no, but notice how I'm not really talking about the BSD porting bit. It's more they care about either Linux and Mac OS or Linux and Windows or Mac OS and Windows and maybe the Linux. So, Windows, so I work for one of those, I used to work for one of the companies that built those Pitman sites. And we had a Windows driver group that we hired much later than the Linux people. And they're, they're from Planet Windows and the people, Linux people are from and how efficient was that process? So it's, it's not particularly efficient. Right. However, it's, it works. No, I know. Because making those people talk to each other would have been a big pain. So I don't think they ever bothered. It happened after I left. And I but again, so any so what happens then is is whenever people fix thing in fix fix things in Windows, there needs to be some kind of internal. Hopefully, there's an internal process to get those bugs pushed into Linux and vice versa. And what I'm saying is, I would like to see. If it's at all possible, your, as an example, your Windows guys do as much development in public as they can so that the open source people can benefit from that same engineering process and fix the same bugs. Oh, I know. And the only way we're going to do it is by demonstrating it's possible and it actually gives us benefit, right? I mean... Yeah, I think that's the, the open question is, do you spend more effort on the abstraction layer and debugging that than you do just having two native drivers. And I'm willing to bet that when you speak to the other network, the other vendors, you'll get the Linux people say, bugger everyone else. And then the people that have to deal with all the other OSs probably share a lot more than you realize. And so that's why I want to try and engage other companies who are obviously doing this um, and get their impact. Because as I said, as a BSD guy only doing BSD, my focus is here. And as a Linux guy and working in only upstream Linux, your focus is here. But the 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 it's this big, right? That's what I'm trying to try and capture. Yeah, and so, I, but I think that the problem is, you know, you have one of those graphs up there. It's hard to get the Linux community people to spend more effort to support other OSs, and so somehow you have to find a way to make it easy. Yeah. You need you need to engage with the community. You need to um, address this problem. This is why we're here. This is. The fact that you can actually use a permissive license in the Linux kernel for an entire driver is not something that's really well known. Mm -hmm. And we really, frankly, didn't really talk about it much because we were the first ones doing it. We saw that as competitive edge. You know, time has gone by, Broadcom has followed, now it's time to educate people. Now it's time to move on to the next level of innovation. Now it's time to actually engage in the community, work with the community in different strategies to address these bigger problems. Like I said, it's easier to just quit it's easier to just engage with the community, become a, a hacker with a beard somewhere, and actually just not care about any company. It really is easy to do that. Mm -hmm. It's harder to actually try to address these problems. But yeah, I, I don't think licensing is the, the issue, though. That's what I was trying to get across is the InfiniBand stack. Right, right. So, so, so what you need to do is also engage with the community. I mean, I'm not saying that you, know, you did something wrong. You, you, you were not aware. You were not thinking about these things. Now, hopefully, people might be more aware about the possibilities of actually sharing code between different operating systems and the fact that we can legally do so with Linux and also maybe engage with the companies and pitch this to them. You know, this is part of, the, this is exactly why we're here. We want to talk to people, engage people, you know, have them start thinking about these things, start throwing the ideas internally, you know, start talking to your attorneys, start talking to your engineers, everyone.
Wait, sorry, Henry. Uh, he, he was waiting right there. I think it's fair. No, I, I've had these discussions before with uh, wireless semiconductor companies, trying to convince them to open up. Um, and normally, you don't have any pushback from the engineers. It's normally the business justification that's hard. And one of the one of the arguments that was given to me, that I I wanted to see what if if you heard it before and if you have an answer for that is that sometimes when you're doing very innovative stuff, when you open that up, yes, users benefit, but the, perce the perception is that your next competitor actually benefits more because they can take something that, that you've spent a lot of time to develop and they just have to copy that. Did you hear that? And you, did, yeah, Is that so, something? So, oh. yeah. What the heck? What the, oh, here it is. I want to hear it. How about hearing breathing? Yes, but and there's a but here. Um, those are legitimate concerns because at the end of the day, if they don't sell, if they don't sell their chips, they don't. They don't. They may not be around for the next round, right? The question is, 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 is how much of their new shiny extension stuff needs to be kept proprietary, and how much of the rest of it is just packet pushing? Okay. The, the next thing to keep in mind is, is uh, how much of a leg up do you get by implementing all the draft standards before the standards are released? Someone comes up with a new way of doing something. You want to have the leg up by just putting all your engineering effort into getting some new wireless extension working. Right? And you can go through the mailing list and find that companies do code drops magically once the spec is ratified or when one of the drafts is published. I mean, it's not unheard of for companies to do this. So the question really you've got to engage them to say is, well, if, okay, fine, there are some things that you can't open, okay. How do we try and make it so that our driver, let the, the, whatever we push into Linux lets us do the proprietary stuff internally somehow and we keep it separate from packet pushing. And the example is at 6 kl where for at 6 kl all of the P2P stuff is done in it's all done in, all the protocol stuff's done in user land through the supplicant. And companies who wish to do any kind of proprietary extensions to IE handling or whatever, they can do that through the Netlink, the Netlink interface and WPA supplicant. The driver itself still works quite happily. And what we push out to the community still works as a perfectly good driver. But companies can and will go and take that stuff and layer on their own mobile-y type, peer-to-peer-y type, power-saving-y type streaming video to your television stuff. Right, doesn't necessarily preclude us from opening something up. Um, but again, it requires the company to be thinking, well, we're going to open source this, right? So if we're going to open source this, where do we draw the boxes in order to be able to open source some of it? Because the alternative is, is we open source none of it. And okay. Additionally, you can also uh, architect your design uh, to address this in user space, right? Uh, and this is a kernel talk, right? So. The idea is to address kernel and to simplify the patent problem in kernel space. Simplify it by moving into user space and prioritize in through an architectural review, clean kernel code, and working with the community and taking advantage of actually innovation through the community uh, because we will get collaborative development if you enable the community properly. Uh, so these are things that would need to be weighed. Um, I, I would think that there's likely some innovation that goes on into a driver, but really it's not rocket science. Drivers are really easy. 70% um, of the software in, 70% <laughs> of the software in the kernel is drivers and it's not really rocket science. Thank you. Yeah. All right, last, last question. Because I'm so hungry. Having, having just gone through last year, pushing out a driver and ripping out tons and tons of OS abstraction layer. Yes. <laughs> right? you're, you're now coming back and saying, oh, you should have OS abstraction layers. So. Not in Linux. Okay. So what I'm saying is if you guys maintained a public repository with the entire driver, the, the OS abstracted driver, right, and then had a way of doing, taking that and pushing those changes, you do the changes in that first because that's what you're going to be doing internally, and then you push that minus the abstraction stuff into Linux. Then anything that you do to your OS extraction layer driver that does all the other stuff, we can benefit from. Everyone can benefit from. The problem is, right, is... But the OS abstractions get down to things like register, read, and write 
I know. macros, right? So, but so right now, how, I'm not. How are you suggesting to structure the code in that upstream? So the problem is, right, is you guys, you guys, as an unnamed company, still have this problem, right? You still have an internal driver that you target other stuff sure. with, right? Yeah. So you still have to maintain both of those drivers, right? And okay. the engineering process now is you either have everything go into one driver that you then push into Linux, or you have two separate teams that try to cross-pollinate, and God, yeah, God knows. things get thrown over the wall. Right? Yeah, right. So the question is, is can we benefit from the first team that's still looking after this multi-platform driver that probably is involved in much more chip bring up and, much, and sees much more of the architectural problems across the platforms than Linux, the Linux driver does? Because if you guys did that, if you maintained a public driver, I would port that shit to be, well, sorry, I can't do that anymore. Last year I would have ported that shit to BSD in a heartbeat. Now I'll poke somebody and say, you should do this so my MacBook can run Linux, uh, run, run BSD. But you know, the point still stands that, as it stands, um, ignoring the I want to run BSD on everything in the world rant, um, we don't benefit from what that first team does. We may benefit from the second team, but I'd like to, the community to see why you guys have these layers, how much engineering goes into it, what it's involved bringing up a new chip, and we can see when you commit stuff over time or when you fix bugs, and if you have a, if everyone works through the kernel, dot bugzilla dot org, dot org site or whatever, and and actually fix bugs in a public way, the rest of the community can start to appreciate what it takes to be a real in, real engineer, a real hardware engineer. And that's the kind of feedback I want to, that's the kind of exposure I want to give to the rest of the open source community. But no, what you did in Linux driver, please keep doing it. Yeah, okay. okay. Well, wait, wait, I'm, yeah. I'm not there anymore. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not talking for my company either. <laughs> all right, thank you all for coming. Let's go eat.